Kill everyone now. Condone first degree murder. Advocate cannibalism. Eat shit. Filth are my politics. Filth is my life. Take whatever you'd like. 50 years later, those words still ring true and have shaped me into the idiot that I am today. And hopefully I won't be demonetized just for saying them. Just kidding. This channel doesn't make a dime. Pink Flamingos remains the most famous John Waters film from his pre-hairspray career. It also happens to be my second favorite movie of all time. But is it the best John Waters film? As we've discussed before on this channel, there's a difference between something being the best versus being your favorite. The sixth se- the, the sixth- the, the sixth sense. The sixth- the sixth set. The sixth sense is the best M. Night Shyamalan movie, but my favorite will always be The Visit. The Dark Knight is regarded as the best Batman movie, but my personal favorite will always be Batman Returns. Pink Flamingos is my favorite John Waters film, but is it the best? In some ways, yeah. But Ya yeah, Anna, I would like to present my statement to this jury up on here on this day and argue that Female Trouble, which came out two years after Flamingos and is tied for my second favorite movie of all time is, in fact, the Superior Waters creation. Boom, 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 boom. Greetings, my good bitches. Ooh, girl. The name's Francis, Coke Francis. I'm an editor, comedy writer, drag artist, and I'm here because I believe in incest and car accidents. And because every month is Pride Month, Female Trouble is the second installment in John Waters' trilogy of trash comprised of Pink Flamingos from 1972, Female Trouble in 1974, and Desperate Living in 1977. The first two star the legendary Harris Glenn Milstead. What, you've never heard of him? Okay, fine. Divine. Legendary drag queen Divine. If you've never heard of Divine, first of all, how did you find my channel? Second of all, please get your shit together and find out. You normies may have spotted him in The Little Mermaid, where Ursula's character design was specifically based off of him. Divine and John were childhood friends whose working relationship lasted until Divine's death in 1988. Together, they founded the Dreamlanders, a name affectionately given to John's frequent collaborators, which included homeless people, drug addicts, sex workers, and any other colorful characters from the fringes of society. When you combine all these people with someone as delightfully devious as John Waters, how could you not come out with a product that's completely original? Love him or hate him, there is nobody out there like John, and there never will be. There it is again. Oh no, it's 4th of July! Oh my god. You guys, I just realized I'm filming this on 4th of July, and I just realized that other people actually celebrate this holiday, so... Oh god. <laughs> oh fucking no. Divine and Waters made a number of deranged, transgressive films from 1964 to 1970, like Multiple Maniacs or Mondo Trasho or Eat Your Makeup. The release of Pink Flamingos finally put the duo on the map. As the tagline suggests, it is indeed an exercise in poor taste, though that's putting it mildly. It features wholesome family fun like animal cruelty, a singing anus, and most famous Famously, a scene where Divine actually eats real dog shit. It's one of the most offensive, shocking, and vile movies ever made. And that's exactly why we love it. To this day, it's one of the most celebrated movies of all time. And in 2021, it was selected for preservation by the Library of Congress's National Film Registry. Hashtag gay excellence. Hashtag it's still Pride Month, goddammit. With the monumental success of Pink Flamingos on their hands, the Dreamlanders had a tough act to follow. But follow it they did with 1974's Female Trouble. It's not nearly as famous as Pink Flamingos, likely due to the lack of dog shit eating and hilariously flaccid incest. Upon release, it didn't make quite as big of a slash in the midnight movie multiverse. However, in my humble opinion, it's equally chaotic and happens to have a more fully realized concept, more ambitious storytelling, and more character... 
evolution? I don't know if it's development, but a lot happens to the characters in this movie. A lot happens in this movie, and you'll get to see a good amount of it with me today. But before we begin, if you're a fan of hearing a very tired drag queen talk about nerd shit forever, I ask that you please demand your parents give you cha-cha heels for Christmas. When you open your presents and find out they didn't get you any, insult and belittle them before knocking over their Christmas tree, unzipping your pants, and dick slapping those like and subscribe buttons as hard as you can. Let's get loud. So we open with credits with a song performed by Divine, written by him and John. A lot of people don't know this, but Divine actually had a pretty successful music career in addition to acting. Every goddamn song he put out is the most punk rock shit I have ever heard. And if you don't believe me, watch his appearance on Letterman in the 80s. I'm cheap. <laughs> You're welcome. Anyway, we're introduced to Dawn Davenport, a bratty teenager from the 1960s who uses even more hairspray than I do. She makes it clear right off the bat that she better get a pair of cha-cha heels for Christmas, immediately establishing the catalyst for all the events of this movie. You see, female trouble wastes no time, always cuts right to the chase, and its script is tighter than this goddamn suit. Fuck home, fuck homework. Who cares if we fail? Big mood. As you probably already know, people were given way more license to openly be dicks to each other back in the day. Insert softy, generation, snowflake, sad boy, contrarian joke here. Some narc calls out Dawn for pulling a Jack Black in School of Rock and gets fat shamed by all of humanity. I told you things were different back then. I'd like to set fire to this dump. Just cause we're pretty, everybody's jealous. Also a big mood. You know what? I'm gonna bring something back. Something I haven't used since my Paperman video. Let's roll out the big mood counter. So now it's Christmas morning at the Davenport household, and the one thing motivating Dawn to get out of bed is that under that Christmas tree, she'll finally find a pair of them cha-cha heels. They certainly seem like a nice family. Wonder if we'll see more of them later. The moment of truth is here, and you know what? This is one of the most, if not the most iconic scenes of this entire movie, so I'm gonna let it speak for itself. What are they? Those aren't the right kind. I told you cha-cha heels, black ones. Nice girls don't wear cha-cha heels. I told you the kind I wanted. You ruined my Christmas. Come on, not on Christmas. Get off me, you ugly <laughs> witch. You devil, come here. You'll pay for this. I hate you. Fuck you. Fuck you both, you awful people. You're not my parents. I hate you. I hate this house. I hate Christmas. <laughs> Like I said earlier, this is what sets off the chain of events for the rest of the film. Just remember, everything that'll happen in the next 80 minutes or so are entirely because Dawn didn't get cha-cha heels for Christmas. Dawn runs away from home and hitchhikes with a scummy dude named Earl Peterson, who looks awfully familiar. And sounds awfully familiar, doesn't he? Get in, sugar dumpling. <laughs> Yes, Divine has sex with himself on a dirty forest mattress, and we get the rare treat of seeing him out of drag, and wondering which of these sounds he actually made in bed. <laughs> this results in one Divine getting pregnant, and the other Divine refusing to help out, but Dawn is a strong, woman, and she delivers her baby right here on the couch by herself, just like the pioneers. Did the pioneers also cut the umbilical cord with their teeth? Is that what you just do when you have a baby? Pardon my ignorance. <laughs> Personally, I can't stand the things. Over the next few years, Dawn supports herself and her baby Taffy by working a number of odd jobs, including stripping for very old men who are also very body positive. It's actually super cool that she stayed friends with all these girls from high school. To this day, I don't speak to a single living, breathing organism that I went to high school with. They mug people as best squirrel friends. Why? Because girls get it 
done. Jump to 1968 and Taffy is just as shitty of a child as you would expect because, well, all children are shitty. Though I have to say, whose child is this? Like, was she cast after legitimately auditioning for this movie or is she the kid of someone in the cast or crew? Either way, this girl was born to be in a John Waters movie and I hope she's doing well. According to Dawn, the reason Taffy doesn't go to school is because of another addition to our big mood counter. There is no need to know about the presidents, wars, numbers, or science. Dawn and the other girls drag her up the stairs and tie her to a bed in the attic, as all good parents should. Just get your hair done tomorrow and you'll feel better. That's what I always do when I get depressed. We're introduced to Gator, the hairdresser who lives next door, and his Aunt Ida, played by the legendary Edith Massey. Fun fact, apparently it took three people to get Edith into this drippin' cat suit. Gator's the only straight guy at the Lipstick Beauty Salon, much to Ida's dismay, who desperately wants him to be gay. I'm going to let this next scene speak for itself as well because it was revolutionary for its time and still is today. Have you met any nice boys in the salon? Oh, pretty nice. I mean any nice queer boys. Do you fool with any of them? And Ida, you know I dig women. All those beauticians and you don't have any boy dates? I don't want any boy dates. But you could change. Queers are just better. I'd be so proud if you was a fag and had a nice beautician boyfriend. I worry that you work in an office. Have children. Celebrate wedding anniversary. The world of heterosexual is a sick and boring life. Cheers to all the queer folks who were told this exact same thing just reversed. Leave it to John Waters to turn it on its head. You, my good sir, are on some king shit. Girl, it is 9 p.m. and I am caffeinated. <laughs> There's all sorts of goofiness going on at the Lipstick Beauty Salon. Enter Donald and Donna Dasher, played by Dreamlander's David Lockery and Mary Vivian Pierce. Both of them are amazing, but there's just something about the way David Lockery delivers his lines that just is on another level. It makes me tingly inside. It's like... My own version of ASMR. You are quite right, Donna. You see, we are a private salon catering to ravishing beauties only. Even one average customer would be enough to plummet our reputation forever. One has to audition just to be a customer at the Lipstick Beauty Salon, and lo and behold, Dawn Davenport is our winner. And how could she not be after delivering this iconic line? Davenport, Dawn Davenport, I'm a thief and a shit kicker and uh... I'd like to be famous. Here she meets and falls in love with Gator and the two get married, only further breaking poor old Aunt Ida's heart. Cue a new chapter in Dawn's life. It goes just as well as you'd think it would. For me, it was the Olympics on how to censor things in Adobe Premiere. We're caught up to present day in 1974, where Dawn and Gator are having fun with a toolkit and Taffy walks in on them, now grown and played by veteran Dreamlander Mink Stoll. I don't know why she always holds her dress like this, but for some reason it's just really fucking funny to me. But she rightfully despises Gator for reasons I am too exhausted to continue censoring. If you want to see it, go watch this movie right now. You should have been doing that ages ago instead of watching this filth. What's the big deal about money? It's so easy to get. I can't imagine why anybody works. It boggles my imagination. But things are looking up for the now Miss Davenport. The Dashers request to meet with her privately and give her the career opportunity of a lifetime. And no, it's not a pyramid scheme that that girl who bullied you in middle school joined. The Dashers and I see crime and beauty as synonymous, and they ask Dawn to be her glamour skinny pig per se, where she'll model in front of various crimes she commits. Now, this scene is very important. This is where the social commentary of the movie comes in. Dawn, being the esteemed thief that she is, eagerly accepts the job. Back at home, Taffy is playing Car Accident, which is actually something that John Waters himself did when he was a kid. Now that Gator is finally divorced from Dawn, Aunt Ida tries hooking him up with a nice gay man to finally settle down with. Have I mentioned just how genius this running joke is? Gator announces that he's moving to Detroit after getting read to Phil 
stealth by this super cool dude. And boy, is Aunt Ida mad. Like, really mad. Ah! Again, I don't know why Edith Massey rolling on the floor and screaming for this super long take is makes just makes me laugh so fucking hard. True, it's not Beverly Hills, but crime breeds in these neighborhoods, Donna. It's really an oh so perfect place for our crime model to live. Everything David Lockery says sounds like it's going to be written in stone. Dawn invites the Dashers over for dinner and they take an inaugural picture of her black eye. Taffy humiliates Dawn in front of company like the hilarious cunt that she is, and the two get in a fight, much to the delight of the Dashers. And so begins Dawn's career as a crime model. We're about halfway through the movie, and I just want to remind you, my good bitches, that everything that has happened, and everything that will happen, is because Dawn didn't get cha-cha heels for Christmas. Six minutes go by, and Aunt Ida is still screaming, so she pays Dawn a visit and throws a glass of proactive in her face. No, but really, that shit actually destroyed my skin. Unfortunately, I didn't have the luxury of having the Dashers tell me how beautiful I was, like Dawn does here. The medical profession has always shown its extreme ignorance in the beauty field. What you don't realize, Doctor, and really, how could you, is that Miss Davenport will now be more beautiful than if she had had a million dollar facelift. And to think, with all the strides we've made in body positivity over the past decade, and there still isn't representation for models with acid deformities. Hey, hey, modeling industry, be better. She asked me to remind you that she is, of course, without makeup. Oh, oh, makeup. Right. All of Dawn's friends and loved ones have come to her unveiling, and even though she looks like an expired Deadpool, they're all super supportive. How does she have this many friends, though? Is she an anime protagonist? Now I'm starting to wonder if the Dashers are recruiting her into a pyramid scheme because they've given her her a hundred dollars, a photo set, a portrait, a stage, and Ida in a cage whose hand gets chopped off by Dawn. Let's see if some boss babe with the pink Cadillac or whatever beat that. They also start giving Dawn injections of liquid eyeliner and our heroine has fully embraced her body, face, and life of crime work. I love crime too, especially the excitement of getting away with it! Also, can I just say, and this is no disrespect to straight people, but only a gay person could have made this movie. I'm not saying that straight people can't do camp or this kind of humor, but this entire movie, every factor that goes into it, every aspect of it, this is 100% a gay-powered product. I really should be changing my outfit anyway. I've had it on nearly five hours. So Taffy is so desperate to get away from her beauty queen mother that she tracks down her dad and it goes exactly as well as you'd think it would. Arguably the most fucked up scene in the whole movie and that's really saying something. So let's just skip to the part where Taffy stabs him and leaves. I have never felt complete until I experienced an eyeliner rush. You want an egg? There might be a couple old eggs in the kitchen. No, I don't want no goddamn eggs! For those of you who have seen Pink Flamingos, you'll know. What a brilliant callback. So Dawn comes back looking punk as fuck, hell yeah, and Taffy tells her that she's going to live with the Hare Krishna people, to which Dawn literally threatens her with death. Foreshadowing, maybe? You'll see. Jesus Christ almighty! Anyway, we're finally at the moment we've all been waiting for. Dawn's induction into showbiz. Taffy has officially joined the Hare Krishna people, sets Ida free, and tells her to go to the police, who are totally gonna ruin everyone's fun. Just as Dawn promised, she kills Taffy for joining the Hare Krishnas, which amps her up for a show that is literally a fucking sold-out house. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my black little heart. So, another fun fact. This is actually based off a real act that Divine performed at the Palace Theater in San Francisco, where he'd wheel a shopping cart full of mackerel and start throwing them into the audience while claiming responsibility for famous crimes of that era. Yes, good bitches, Divine was a method actor to the highest degree. And I'm so fucking beautiful I can't stand it myself! <laughs> <laughs> 
I was gonna add this to the big mood counter, but this is a level of self-love and confidence that I will likely never attain. She fires several shots into the crowd, the police show up and start doing what they do best, murder people, and Dawn goes on the lam until the cops catch her in a Baltimore forest. Can we just talk about the fact that Divine actually jumped into a sleet-filled lake and didn't lose his wig? Dawn shows up to court rocking a mohawk before they were even cool. The Dashers pull a fat Takashi 6 9 on her and reveal their true intentions like the cunts that they are. I mean, Dawn is toast if this master orator testifies against her. I object, Your Honor, on the grounds that- Which Brandon Rogers character is this? Can't you stupid people see? I'm a huge star! Between the Dashers and Ida's testimony, our heroine is sentenced to die in the electric chair. Despite her new prison lover feeling otherwise, Dawn is far from upset about her upcoming execution. In fact, she's thrilled about it. It's the culmination of a career doing what she did best. We'll get more into that later, but Dawn eagerly makes her way to the electric chair, which John Waters actually still has and keeps in his Baltimore home. She gets fried and freeze-framed as the credits start to roll. No matter how you might feel right now, Dawn is happy. Can't we just all be happy for her? It's hard to judge what makes one movie the best of someone's filmography, unless we're looking at directors who have only made one film, like Charles Lawton or Sia. It should be illegal to put those two names in the same sentence, unless the sentence is, Charles Lawton has gone on record to produce exactly one less offensive depiction of autism than Sia. When I say Female Trouble is the best John Waters movie, what I mean is that when all the elements of filmmaking are taken together, it's the most most consistent and fully realized of his works. Crybaby may have better cinematography and sound, but its storyline wasn't particularly memorable. It did, however, give me a boner. Or... Two? Pink Flamingos might have more iconic, shocking moments, but the filmmaking itself is more haphazard and rickety. Female Trouble may not be the most professional-looking movie in John Waters' resume, but the cinematography and editing are more intentional and composed compared to his previous works. Also, the production design and costumes in this movie are killer. The colors are absolutely dazzling. And most importantly, it's a rich, ambitious story that's well told. Dude, just imagine if this movie was released today. And no, not in a hurt derp, you can never make something like this today, Joe Rogan bitch fest kind of way. I mean, like, imagine if this movie was shot in 4K or digitally at all. I'm not going anywhere with this point, I'm just sharing thoughts. Female Trouble fits comfortably in a literary genre known as Bildungsroman. God bless you. Thank you, sir. It follows the psychological, spiritual growth of a character from youth to adulthood. Think Jane Eyre by Bronte or Great Expectations by Dickens. Female Trouble is a perversion of the genre since she only becomes more unhinged and immoral as the story goes on. She starts out as a bratty teenager who doesn't get what she wants for Christmas, and it gets worse. And yes, I did just successfully compare female trouble to the works of Miss Charles Mary Dickens. By the end, she's a hideous maniac who performs lewd acts on stage and laughs as she guns down her audience. In jail, she talks about her execution as if it's the culmination of her artistic career, and she gives what might as well be an Oscar acceptance speech when she sits in the electric chair. Her descent into madness is, to her, her an ascension. She got what she wanted. She became famous. I'm a thief and a shit kicker and uh, I'd like to be famous. If anything, it's a happy ending. I'm happy, happy, happy. Again, just remember, all of this happened because she didn't get cha-cha heels for Christmas. Just like how according to MatPat, about 250,000 
thousand people died in Death Note because Ryu got bored. The connection between crime and celebrity is central to John Waters' work. His characters make no distinction between fame and infamy. To them, notoriety is aspirational. Bad press is the only press worth having. Pink Flamingos was a film about people literally competing to be the filthiest people alive, but Female Trouble actually explores the larger social concerns around that sentiment. There's a dedication in the film's credits to Charles Tex Watson, a murderer and central member of the Manson family. Waters later said that he regretted this quote, jokey, smartass dedication, saying he did it, quote, without the slightest feeling for the victim's families. When all is said and done, John's a pretty good egg. Still, in a way, Waters was simply reflecting what was going on around him in the early 70s. The Manson murders and subsequent trial was a media circus. Tabloids didn't care about Sharon Tate's bereaved family, and no one gave a damn about the vulnerable young girls that Manson had brainwashed and abused. People were shocked and disgusted, but in a way, they were also entertained. And that sentiment holds true to this day. Between news of COVID and Republicans and what have you, doesn't it just put you in the best mood to see a headline about, like, a creative serial killer? No? Just me? To be clear, it's not innocent people dying that puts me in a good mood. It's just a nice refreshment from the usual news cycle. Let me go on record here. I do not support the killing of innocent civilians. Serial killers are very bad. When it comes to killing people, Coke Francis says no. Anyway, Waters saw just how much people love to indulge these morbid fascinations. Sometimes Sometimes it's fun to put your moral compunctions on hold. Okay, it's always fun. If the recent surge of true crime content has taught us anything, it's that evil and depravity will always have an audience. And Female Trouble is John Waters' most direct and thorough exploration of this appetite. God, if John Waters knew that some neurodivergent queer was scientifically breaking down his movies on the internet, he'd be rolling in his grave. Except he's very much alive, and I still run the risk of him finding out. I should know, because I met him about five years ago. Hashtag always meet your heroes. I would love to hear your opinions in the comment section below, especially because you might just end up having the winning comment for the next video. And now to announce the winning comment from the last one. Devin Bauer says, As a motorcycle rider, constant fire shooting out of your pipes is disturbing slash concerning, but I trust your judgment, so I am just going to go with it and not worry about it and check out this flick and ban. To be fair, constant fire shooting out of anything is disturbing slash concerning, so good on you for exercising caution while riding a motorcycle. Personally, I am I am way too much of a coward to do that shit, so hats off, sir. You too can be featured in the next video. Leave a comment below and I will pick my favorite one and give you a shout out next time. Technically, Female Trouble is available for purchase on YouTube and Amazon Prime, but I feel like John Waters wouldn't really want it that way, so tour in it if you can. But before you do, I ask that you please demand your parents give you cha-cha heels for Christmas. When you open your presents and find out they didn't get you any, insult and belittle them before knocking over their Christmas tree, unzipping your pants, and dick-slapping those like and subscribe buttons as hard as you can. And, as always, until next time.